Hi, fellow classmates, instructors, and friends. This is Ginny, your humble TCM student who knows absolutely nothing about this field, but wanted to start this audio journal to record everything TCM. If you would like to join my study group as well, please come learn with me. And let's get healthier by healing our bodies from the inside out holistically together. Hey, Coco fam. Thank you so much for tuning back with me for another study session. Guess who's back with us today? It's Allison. Welcome back, Allison. Thanks for having me, Jenny. Glad to be back. Thank you. Okay, so from the last time we gathered, she actually described what qi is and the importance of good circulation within your body. Because if you don't have good circulation, you might end up with a lot of different symptoms that you might not want. So for today's topic, we're actually going to relate a little bit back to her specialties, which is fertility health. This is not solely just for females. It is also for males as well, because you guys also have urinary bladders. <laughs> so the Zhang Fu organs that we're going to talk about today would be the kidneys and the urinary bladder. Okay, so I mean, I guess we could jump right into it. Just a little introduction. The Zhang organ is actually the kidney and the Fu organ is the urinary bladder and they are connected somehow. And we're kind of going to discover why they're connected today and what the importance of each organs are. So to start off, I guess we can discuss a little bit about the kidneys, which is the Zhang organ, in terms of what the functions are in TCM aspect, what it controls and how it would affect you. Yeah, sure. So um, you definitely have it right. There's the Zhang organs and then there's the Fu organs. So they're always a pair in Chinese medicine, there's always a yin yang zong fu pair. And so the zong organs are yin and the fu organs are yang. We have like the liver, the heart, the spleen, the lungs, and the kidneys, which are the yin organs. And then the yang organs are the gallbladder, small intestine, stomach, large intestine, and urinary bladder. Um, so the zong organs, uh, they're yin because they kind of like store the bodies fundamental substances and storing is a yin function. It's like holding and containing. And then the foo organs are yang and they're kind of described as hollow where substances move through them. And so that is a more yang function. Right. Because yang is an action. That's why those organs are you know, kind of performing its action. That's why those organs are young. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. So that's kind of the theory. And so, yeah, then specifically the kidney and the urinary bladder are both a zong fu pair in Chinese medicine. And so the kidney is the zong organ. And so kidney, it stores like the body's essences. So that controls uh, birth, growth, development, and reproduction. And also, uh, also importantly, is that it governs the body's water passages through the body and the yin. And the urine or bladder, the foot organ, stores and excretes urine. It's pretty simple. It doesn't do much else than that. <laughs> and so they're linked because they have this similar function in controlling the body's water processes as they are the the water organ the body because each organ system each of the five organ systems have their own sort of element uh, and theme and so the kidney and the urinary bladder are water and so they deal with a lot of the water functions in the body both literally and kind of physiologically Okay, that was a really good start of the description of what each one does. And when I was trying to learn all of these Zhang Fu organs, it sounded like the kidney and the spleen are ultra important, aside from the heart. The spleen and the kidney are like top two. <laughs> Am I correct? Yeah, that is like, true. I feel like obviously the other ones are important too, but if we're talking about like the most important I feel like these two are the main things yeah I definitely agree I might throw liver there in there too I think spleen liver and kidney do so much in the body and yeah 
them alone is dictates so much of what goes in the body and they do have a lot of things that can go wrong with them and create disharmonies um but yeah you're right there there are sort of there's sort of like a hierarchy like i remember studying in school there was like the earth school and then and this is like in ancient china and they thought that the spleen and the stomach they were the most important organ systems and so diet and everything that helps strengthen the spleen and stomach were the most important the foundation of health then i know there's also like a, a kidney school I, can't, i don't remember exactly what they were called but then there's also the, the the people that believe that the kidney organ system was the most important and if you just focus on that then that will lead to really good health too so you're kind of right there the kidney and the spleen stomach are two really important foundational organ systems <laughs> It's so interesting because uh, automatically I would think like going into it, I'm like, oh yeah, obviously the heart is the most important. Are you crazy? You stop <laughs> beating, you'll just die. <laughs> right. <laughs> But in Chinese medicine, it's it's actually the spleen and the kidney, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, that's true. I actually never thought about it like that. That's really <laughs> yeah. true. Yeah, so when I was looking into it, I was like, well, that's very interesting. Um, like, it just by your descriptions, too. Like, it totally makes sense. Now, I know each Zhang Fu organ links up to an element and a season. For the kidney and the urinary bladder, it actually links up to winter and water. Water makes sense because of your description of how it stores water, it, it removes water and everything within your body. But why winter? Is there like a meaning behind it? I know there was like all this ancient study on why each organ relates to a season. But I just don't know how they came up with that. Yeah, so the kidney is linked to the winter just because it's it's what's called like the utmost yin, like the yin of the yin. And so each system, there's like the yin within the yang, the yang within the yin, the yang within the yang. And so each season has like a certain amount of yin and yang, depending on what's going on in the world and with weather and the climate. And so winter is the yin of the yin because it is dark, it is cold, there's usually snow, all these things are very yin. Okay, so when winter comes, does that mean that we need to pay extra attention to our kidneys and our urinary bladder? Yes, exactly. So each season kind of opens up the window of, oh, we have this opportunity to focus on this organ system so we can uh, achieve better health. So yeah, that is a thing. Oh, that's very intriguing. Um, so what would you do to kind of take care of them during winter time? Yeah, so anything that is really yin preserving or yin strengthening is really important in the winter season. So that means it's time to do all the yin things. It, like think about like yoga. So there's like the regular type of yoga, like vinyasa or hatha, that's a bit more intense. And then you have yin yoga, which is slow and gentle and restorative. And so that's kind of how we need to treat winter. So we need to relax more, we need to sleep more. It's not the time to like go out and party all night. Um, It's just the kind of the time where we like rest and nourish and meditate and reflect on things. Ah, oh, okay. For these organs, it also relates to a certain flavor in the mouth. And the particular flavor that you get in the mouth are salty and bitterness, which I find kind of strange. Like I, I would never notice the flavor in my mouth. Like I, I, I think that's kind of the flavor that you might taste when you wake up if you have issues with your kidney or urinary bladder is that right yeah that's yeah that's definitely probably relevant like before you eat something or brush your teeth notice if there's a certain flavor in your mouth or if you notice it just like throughout the day randomly so yeah because each organ system it has its own element it also has its own flavor so The kidney is salty. Bitter is actually the heart. Ah. Um, yeah, so they're two, they're two different flavors and two different organ systems. And there's also sweet, which is the spleen, and then sour, which is liver. And I think, what would be lungs? 
like pungent or something like spicy but I don't know if anyone ever has like a pungent spicy taste in their mouth but the like sweet salty bitter those are like the more common ones ah okay so I wonder how strong that flavor is I don't think I've ever (laughs) noticed that a a flavor in my mouth when I when I wake up in the morning have you yeah I'm not sure either like (laughs) no it's not ever or something I've I've often paid attention to um I yeah it's just one of those like random diagnostic tools like I don't think I've I've ever had a patient like straight out tell me I have this really crazy bitter flavor in my mouth all the time or something but it is it is absolutely something that um that someone could tell you or that you ask about one of your patients um if you're a Chinese medicine practitioner to gather more information to come up with a diagnosis but it's not something I would rely on heavily it's just kind of like a weird little like side effect yeah I feel like you have to be very aware -aware (laughs) self-aware in order to (laughs) to notice that flavor in your mouth but these organs actually link up to other parts of your body as well which is the marrow, your ears, and your hair. Now, I know in traditional Chinese medicine, our brain is actually made up of marrow in the TCM perspective. Yes. (laughs) So that's huge. Does it dictate our emotions and our thoughts? Like, how does that work? Like, why are they related to the marrow and the ears and the hair? If you're having hair loss mm-hmm. issues, does that mean that your kidneys aren't the greatest? Oh, these are all really good questions. Okay, I like your thought process. It's very, like, logical. Chinese medicine is not as logical. Damn. So, <laughs> so the marrow. So marrow is, it's not just the direct like bone marrow in Chinese medicine. So it's kind of like marrow with the capital M that it is this vague sort of theoretical concept. So the bone marrow of Chinese medicine is more of this like really vital substance of the body. And so it's kind of this vague term that creates the spinal cord, the brain and the bone marrow. So you can kind of think of as like the innermost stuff of like your bones and nervous system. And this is like a deficiency in marrow is usually related to like a kidney essence deficiency in Chinese medicine. And so like a lot of these symptoms might mean like a poor memory and concentration issue of the brain or like weak bones or something like scoliosis, or you're born with uh, like a developmental disorder or a reproductive disorder. That would be kind of an issue with the kidneys and the marrow system of the kidneys. Mm -hmm. In Chinese medicine, however, your emotions and your thoughts don't come from your brain. Hmm. In Chinese medicine, it comes from your heart. So your heart is your shen in Chinese medicine. And so shen controls a lot of your emotions and is very influenced by emotion. And that kind of makes sense. Like when we're stressed or happy, like we can feel it in our heartbeat. So in Chinese medicine, the the heart is more of, of your like emotional mind. Okay. So the thoughts also come from your heart as well? Yes. Okay. Oh my goodness. That's they didn't so really weird. put much attention to the brain. Yeah, they, I guess, kind of reason that a lot of this has to do with the heart. Interesting. Oh, and your comment about hair. Yeah. So, yes, the kidneys do kind of nourish the hair. So, a deficiency in kidneys could mean like thin, brittle, dry hair or early graying, something like that which happens as we age because naturally as we age we use a bit more and more of our kidney essence and it kind of slowly depletes and that's why we kind of get like hearing issues or issues with our hair and stuff it it grays that's kind of a natural process but the liver blood also supplies the hair and so I see a lot more of like liver blood deficiency not nourishing the hair leading to drier hair and gray hair or hair falling out which is kind of like an iron deficiency. Like, you know, if you're anemic, your hair can fall out. And that's because the liver doesn't have enough blood to nourish the hair. So I see a lot more liver involvement with the hair than the kidneys. Um, although I guess maybe like when you're 40 or 50 plus, it's definitely more of a kidney thing. Although you can't, you have to rule out a liver issue as well. So that kind of takes a bit more differential diagnosis. Wow. Wow, that was great. That was such a good like explanation okay so random thought now 
Uh-huh. You know how collagen powder is like the rave right now? Everyone's taking collagen powder. Oh my God, put collagen and everything. Like collagen is such like a like a like a popular word now. So with collagen powder, obviously it targets your bones and your hair and slash nails and stuff. So does that actually nourish your kidney? That's a really good question. I never thought of this. Mm-hmm. I would think, so collagen, it's like amino acid protein-y, right? So I would, it's got an, it's definitely like a tonic, like it nourishes. I would say, yeah, it probably nourishes liver and kidney. The Western culture is more so like, oh, we have a specific thing we want to target. And so we're going to target that specific thing and help you cure it right? So specifically hair loss or whatever. But for traditional Chinese medicine, it's more so trying to find your root cause and then correcting it. So then you end up correcting a bunch of things in order for that one ultimate thing you actually wanted to cure. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's a good point. When they marketed the collagen powder, maybe... It just, it was just better to just call out the end results to market that. Well, then again, it's not like those were TCM. They wouldn't know the kidney thing, I guess. Yeah, totally. That's a really, that's a really good question. I feel like it's just a very Western mindset of here is a very specific problem. Here's a very specific solution. And it's very based on your symptoms. Like this is the thing for when your knee hurts. This is the thing for when you have a headache. But a lot of these different symptoms in Chinese medicine, they do have a root and that root can be, you know, any of the deficiencies or excesses of the organ system. Yeah, and a a disharmony with an organ system can produce quite a few different symptoms. So if you are addressing that root cause, all of those symptoms should vanish. That's very true. Okay, so since we're talking about solving the root cause, when there's imbalances between the kidney or the urinary bladder, is it a possibility for one organ to be balanced and the other not? Like your jaw organ can be balanced, but your foo organ is imbalanced? Or if one is imbalanced, both would always be imbalanced because they're connected. Right. That's, that's a good question. I think you can, I think that can exist. I think you can have a good and bad organ system together. I think having like a poorly functioning kidney might predispose you to having bladder issues, but I don't think it's like a set truth. If you have a kidney issue, you also have a bladder issue. Hmm. Okay. So Talking about yin and yang, within each organ, there's also yin and yang. So if you are yin deficient in your kidneys, like how would that look like? What are some of the symptoms that would flare up if you have a yin deficiency in your kidneys for, per se? So uh, so remember yin is like the nourishing, moistening, cooling sort of element. So a kidney indeficiency, you might have night sweats or hot flashes. You might have tinnitus, like a ringing in your ears, insomnia. And then because kidneys kind of relate to bones, you can have like a weak knees or knee pain or like a, or low back pain because the kidneys kind of govern the low back too, because that's where they're located. So any kind of low back and knee issue also points to kidneys. Wow. I felt like you just described me. (laughs) <laughs> oh no! <laughs> um, again. My, I know. Well, uh, the, the thing is, I don't know how. I don't know how, and this is why the next question is coming. Okay. <laughs> like, if that's the case, like, for example, for me, right? I know I am yin deficient in my kidney. Like, how, what can I do to nourish my yin back to? balance again like are there foods that I could purchase through grocery stores that I could make so I could change up my diet in order to fix this problem uh 
I know also I should go to like acupuncture and everything <laughs> right. to kind of like help it as well, which I would like on a monthly basis. But on top of that, like diet is a huge part, as you said, too. So I just wanted to know, is there like an easier way for the listeners that might also have these symptoms to perhaps start with their diet first? Yeah, absolutely. Diet is definitely one of the, the pillars or one of the, the foundations of good health in Chinese medicine. So there's a lot that you can do through diet because we do see different foods as having like therapeutics similar to herbs. So Chinese herbs are kind of like food therapy on steroids. So they're like a lot more intense and can fix these disharmonies and create um you know, balance within the organ systems a lot faster and a lot more efficiently. I find diet therapy, yeah. especially if it's something like really deep or really long term, it's going to take a long time, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you shouldn't always be working on it too. And so you can actually look up, there's quite a few websites that have like different organ system and balanced diets because there's so many random foods and food products that you can buy and, and cook for different organ system imbalances. They're all like very random and they kind of don't really make a lot of sense to me sometimes, but I did write down a few of them. For, for kidney yin, some of the main ones are like asparagus, sweet potatoes, black beans, tofu, fish, and eggs. Like, so that's kind of an example of foods that help support kidney yin. Ah, that's really good. That's really good. Okay, so what if it's the opposite now? Your kidney is yang deficient. What symptoms would you see? Right, so yang is the warming, invigorating uh, sort of thing in Chinese medicine. So if you have a lack of that, the biggest sort of symptoms is that you'll feel really cold especially like the lower half of your body or for your feet. It's really hard for you to warm up. You might be really pale, especially in your face, like a white pale. Your tongue's gonna be big and puffy because your fluid metabolism just isn't strong enough, doesn't have that yang energy to circulate very well. You might have edema. You might have profuse, clear urination. Infertility is a huge kidney yang um, deficiency symptom. Yeah, stuff like that. Ooh, I have to say, I feel like a lot of girls like feel very cold all the time um mm -hmm. so does that mean that well i mean there might be there's probably more meanings to it <laughs> i don't want to assume <laughs> but not that simple <laughs> not that simple not that simple but if you know just in case of that might be the case you know what are some of the food suggestions that you would suggest for people that run colder and might have yang deficiency in their kidneys mm -hmm. Well, I think an important thing first is, is your cold due to a yang deficiency? Because if you're, if you think that you do have yang deficiency because you're basing that just off your body temperature, then if you add a whole bunch of yang tonics, that might aggravate it if it's due to something else. So mm. if I have a patient that feels cold a lot of the time, I'll always ask them, do you feel like it's your whole body? Do you feel like you just run cold? Or is it just your hands and feet and the rest of your body feels fine or even warm? Mm -hmm. Because if you're, if it's a kidney yang deficiency or just a yang deficiency in general, sort of type of cool body temperature, they're just going to feel cold all over, kind of all the time, maybe mostly, um, mostly feet. But if it's due to like a, a, a chi stagnation and that chi isn't propelling the blood, to move to the extremities in order to warm, then that can also cause cold hands and cold feet. So I'll also see people where like, oh, like just, you know, my hands and feet just never warm up, but the rest of my body feels fine. I might even feel like warm a lot of the time. Mm. That's just because all the chi is kind of stuck here. And so it's just not able to flow to the extremities to warm them up. So if you add a lot of yang tonics to that, that might just aggravate the chi stagnation and make things worse. It might, you know, help invigorate the chi a little bit. So you might notice a little bit too, but it's not cold body temperature can be so many different things. It should be like, I don't know, the saying in Chinese medicine, like it's not that simple. <laughs> There's it's a lot more complicated to that. That's just like Chinese medicine in a nutshell. It's very simple, but it's also not that simple. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it makes so, sense though. In terms yeah. of your chi explanation, like like it makes sense in the way that if your internal circulation is not going, obviously it's not reaching to the hardest parts of your body, which is 
your hands and your feet because they're the most extended per se. So it makes sense that maybe it's just not the best qi circulation, then it won't reach to those places. So it makes sense. Oh, and then you mentioned um, the foods. So the foods that, that warm kidney yang are like, I mean, there are, it's, this one makes more sense. It's like all the warming things. So like warm foods in general, things that are kind of like spicy, like onions and radishes, uh, scallions, walnuts, chicken, lamb, and any kind of warming spices like curry or turmeric or something. Mmm, tasty. Okay. So would it be similar symptoms for yin deficiency for the urinary bladder? Now talking about the fu organ? Uh, no, it'd be different. It would be different. So I think there is a yin deficiency of the urinary bladder. I think that would just be a result of a kidney indeficiency just manifesting through the urinary bladder. But the urinary bladder is a bit more simple. Like I feel like the main sort of symptom and disharmony is damp heat. And that is what accumulates easily in the urinary bladder based on diet, lifestyle, whatever kind of other disharmonies. So how would that look like if you have damp heat in your urinary bladder? That would manifest as kind of like a typical UTI symptom. So like you have frequency and urgency, painful urination, uh, low back pain. You might have dark urination, might be really dark yellow uh, color. It might be just really scanty, just like little bits at a time. That would be a damp heat in the in the bladder. Okay. Okay. But UTI is not always damp heat though. There's other, there can be like the chi stagnation type, the blood stagnation type. I think there is a yin deficiency type, but the most common one is damp heat. Okay. Yeah, because UTI is actually one of my random questions later. So we'll get Yeah. <laughs> okay. Get, we'll get deeper into that one later because yeah, man, the questions I have about UTI. <laughs> um <laughs> So does it have a yang deficiency or is it like same thing? Like it, it doesn't really have a yin or yang. Well, it, it does. They all have a yin yang, but I, it, again, it'd be kind of more of like the kidney yang deficiency manifesting through the bladder. Mm, okay. So then the food recommendations would still be the same. Yes, for that one. Okay. Got it. Got it. I would definitely change up my diet. <laughs> but if you are prone to damp heat in your urinary bladder, then it's not just you want to tonify your, your yin and your yang because damp heat is an excess accumulation. So you don't want to add tonifying things to something that is already excess. You want to reduce something that is excess. So with damp heat through the diet, you kind of like you need to avoid spicy, greasy foods like fast foods, anything fried that's really damp heat in your diet that can transmute to the to the bladder uh, but then also like dairy and cold raw foods can also produce dampness in your spleen and stomach which then can create heat leading to damp heat in the body that can then transmute to the bladder as well so they they, they kind of do have different different kind of diet recommendations depending on what's going on so anything that's tasty i know right that's the annoying <laughs> thing about chinese medicine you have to be so healthy <sighs> I know. <laughs> it's it's funny you brought this up because I've talked to one of my best friends and <laughs> he goes and sees Chinese practitioner from time to time and he's always just telling me, it's just like, ugh, it's like the same shit every single time <laughs> I go. It's just telling me I have damp heat every single time. I swear to God, every single person has damp heat because who doesn't eat fried food? Who doesn't eat greasy food if you're going out to eat you're gonna eat greasy food who doesn't eat raw food like salad and stuff like everyone has freaking damp heat yeah, <laughs> yeah yeah and you're very true a lot of people do and i think that's kind of one of the misconceptions of chinese medicine because people are like oh i think we talked about this last time like oh i have liver cheese stagnation oh i have kidney yang deficiency and it's like really scary and really overwhelming and they think it's really bad but everyone's got liver cheese stagnation. Everyone's got some sort of kidney disharmony. It's like everyone has a bunch of little things going on. And that a lot of that can depend on how we were born, how healthy our parents were during conception and pregnancy. And, you know, our genetics, a lot of it has to do with our body constitution, how we were born and everything. But it's when these little disharmonies that we all kind of have 
to sort of get bigger and produce symptoms, that is when it's the problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I mean, you know, I guess we can all just do our part to try to eat healthy on a regular basis (laughs) and have balance that way. Hey, Monday to Friday, you know, just like work have good diet and then weekends go all out you know (laughs) exactly and yeah and a lot of it i think it's just it's important to know like what are you prone to like what are your body what is your body constitution in chinese medicine so what are some things that you should make sure you have in your diet every once in a while or just be aware of symptom wise when you're kind of off track but also like if you're taking care of your digestive system your spleen your stomach if your organs are fairly healthy they're going to be able to tolerate a lot of stuff like if you've got a good strong spleen it can take fast food that's fine it can take fried food just it's when it becomes out of balance and it's too much of it that your spleen's like okay this is too much i can't handle it and then it creates symptoms right right okay i think that's why it's so important to you know talk to you guys like the professionals to kind of mentor us through like what these symptoms are from each of these organs so then we could potentially look out for these symptoms and because you guys are also providing recommendations on food and everything that's how we could actually step toward a healthier lifestyle being more aware of ourselves and correcting it after so then we could prevent you know, disease later down the road. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Like a a correct diagnosis of your body constitution can do wonders. Yeah, so that's why I really appreciate you. (laughs) (laughs) No problem. Uh, Okay, so what are some of the tips that you could provide us in terms of, are there any routines or habits? I know we kind of touched on food already, so we don't really need to go into that. But are there any routines or habits that we need to take up in order to have a healthier urinary bladder and kidney? (laughs) Yeah, definitely. There's tons of lifestyle things. So to nourish your kidney in, it's basically all about self-care, nourishing self-care. So it's having a calm lifestyle. You're not burning the candle at both ends. You're going to bed early enough. You're not consuming a whole bunch of really stimulating or drying things like caffeine or alcohol because these are really stimulating and drying. And then with yang deficiency, you need to stay warm. Like don't overwork yourself, get enough sleep, make sure you're eating enough calories and nutrients and getting some sunshine because that's really good yang energy. So there's a lot of a lot of stuff that you can do. Basically just things we kind of already know, like stay warm, go to bed, don't work too hard (laughs) okay i'm laughing as you're listing out all these things i'm like Mm -hmm. oh my goodness i feel (laughs) like you're describing everyone in their 20s (laughs) yes that's so true Like everyone in their 20s, they have this mentality where they're like, oh my God, I have FOMO. I have to like go out and party with my friends. I have to drink a lot to impress people. I have to like have a hustling lifestyle just so I could get a promotion. So they're working all the time. They're not sleeping. They're drinking all the time. They're eating whatever Mm -hmm. they can eat because they're young and it's late and they <laughs> and your want body to can go out and handle have, it. Yeah. Yeah. So I was like, oh man, that, that, that's a killer. <laughs> it's just unfortunately modern lifestyle is not conducive to a really healthy body. Like we kind of know this, like the American diet, the standard American diet is awful for us. Nobody exercises enough. We all work too hard. Like these are all really Western things. And why do you think a lot of the Western world has so many health problems? Because we're really not taking good care of ourselves. And I think a lot of this is the, these are the real roots. And we really do in our twenties, like we have enough essence where we can burn through it and we can go out and party and do a whole bunch of drugs and drink, pull all nighters. And it's not a huge deal. Like you're, you're, you have enough kidney essence where you're not gonna notice a lot of depletion. 
But then you might start to feel it when you hit your 30s, your 40s, your 50s. You start noticing hormonal imbalances and your period's all off or out of whack. You're struggling with infertility because these are really kidney-based things. So, and uh, or digestive issues because you abused your spleen and stomach and ate a whole bunch of raw, like wrong things for so many years that now you're noticing the symptoms. So our body can tolerate a lot, but only to a certain extent. Wow, that's... Uh... That's, <laughs> you heard it first here. So, because <laughs> you mentioned like burning, right? Burning up your energy and your essence. From our last chat, you know, about chi and essence, we talked about how like, oh, hey, you might have 50% that's inherited and 50% acquired. So when you're in your 20s and you're going out all the time and having that type of lifestyle, you must be burning that essence faster than you normally would just to like keep up with your yourself, I guess. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So that's why you have less essence as you age and mm -hmm. damn damn I know. <laughs> and then we're fucked at a later age <laughs> yes and no like hopefully you get the message eventually that oh this is starting to not feel so good you know how like yeah. you get more hungover after a few drinks in your like 30s as opposed to your 20s that's because your body just can't handle it anymore your liver is like no thank you this is too much can't handle it you could handle it way back when when your body was in better shape but now now it's not now it's sending the message that oh you need to start taking better care of yourself like your body is sending you these signs we're just so prone to ignore them and to just power through it moral of the story listen to your body <laughs> yeah exactly your body's yeah. telling you everything and like, you need to know you know just have fun but have moderate fun <laughs> in moderation <laughs> yes well balance is key too you need to live like i still go out and have fun and you know have drinks with your friends and everything but yeah just balance okay so again we come to the section where i kind of have random questions that's bubbling in my mind that relates back to these organs obviously so uh, the first one was recently I talked to another practitioner and she mentioned that, hey, uh, if your back of your knees aren't covered, <laughs> wind is going to penetrate through the back of your knees and go straight up to your kidney and it's just going to mess your kidney up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was like, what? That scared me because I was like, I wear bicycle shorts all the time in the summer. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the summer, it's not as it's not as cold out. So the summer is fine. I mean, I would say what's more important is that is crop tops. People are wearing so many crop tops because they're so cute and I'm guilty of it myself too. But then you're exposing your low belly and your low back which is very key kidney and reproductive organ area where cold can so easily penetrate and get into your, your kidneys and your reproductive organs. And the amount of people that I see with cold in their uterus because they're not dressing right or just things that they're eating or poor lifestyle is like astronomical. Everyone's got cold in their uterus, at least in the Pacific Northwest. But it's a really common thing. So I would say more important than the backs of the knees, although that is a thing, is the low belly and low back. And your neck too, actually. You're supposed to like, because neck um, wind and cold can kind of penetrate and make you sick. So protecting your neck like with scarves is really good for your immune system. Ah, okay. Uh, <laughs> that explains those stupid like sweaters with, turtlenecks without sleeves <laughs> <laughs> I always yeah. thought those were weird I was like okay why are you wearing a sweater without sleeves but it has a turtleneck okay yeah. <laughs> that would be very um, TCM approved <laughs> yeah so you mentioned yes do not wear crop tops because when it's cold of... out if it's really hot out not a huge issue but people are wearing them when it's like I don't know 10 degrees or something in, in Vancouver and it just makes me cringe like oh they're poor their poor organ systems are gonna take a hit <laughs> it's like ah cold uterus 
<laughs> I'm like the grandma, <laughs> cover up. <laughs> but what if you wear high waisted jeans? Like that covers oh, the. Great. <laughs> no, not yep. enough. No, it's perfect. It's good. Okay. Yeah, I mean, well, there's still like a little well, depends on the on a the, little on sliver the in the jeans. If there's a little <laughs> sliver, like maybe okay, but it depends on it depends on the extent of of the exposure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It's getting real detailed. <laughs> Definitely those low rise jeans from the 2000s are no good with the crop no. tops like Britney Spears and Christina oh, Agu- Aguilera. I heard they're coming back. I've heard low rise pants. They are. Right? From, from Fashion Week. Yes. From your Fashion Week. That's all I've been seeing. And I'm just like, no. Why did we think that was a good idea? They're so uncomfortable. They were. Like every time you bend over to grab something, it's like almost your ass crack is like saying hi. Yes. <laughs> uh, that was good. Uh, anyway. <laughs> anyways, so on to the foo organ. So the foo organ, which is the urinary bladder. The biggest question I have is UTI. My goodness, so many women have UTI. Around 50 to 60% will experience this in their lives. And once you have it, you can't get rid of it. Oh, it's so hard. (laughs) It's so hard. Like, I could speak from experience and boy, it's a bitch. Yes, yes, (laughs) yes, 100%. Uh, There was a moment in time where it escalated so much like okay so it started off having it once a year then it doubled to twice a year then it like quadrupled to four times a year i was like what is going oh, no. on now and now for the listeners out there like you might think i'm dirty but no i <laughs> know no i i am not okay because uh, first of all I drink lots of water. And second of all, well, now it kind of de-escalated back to like just once or twice a year. However, I still have them and it's very irritating. And I don't know, maybe TMI, but majority of, of us might get it after sex, even though we do shower with pH soap and we like you know go to the bathroom after just to like cleanse it now i thought uti was more so this is more like western i guess it's more so a virus they would call it you're saying it's more like damp heat and it's coming from your kidney now i guess in a way it makes sense because i am yin deficient in my in my kidney so (laughs) hence maybe that's why I have UTI. Not sure. Self-diagnosing? <laughs> yeah. So a little bit. Well, so damp heat does not come from your kidneys. It usually comes from spleen and stomach because it's usually digestion related. So the kidneys themselves can't have damp heat. It's usually coming from some other organ system or just how, because damp heat, like it, dampness pulls down. So it's like a lower body heavy thing. And so what is our lower organ systems? It's the bladder. So damp heat just like sinks to the bladder in the body. And that happens. So, and it's usually bacterial based, not virus based. So I think one one of the most important things, if it, yeah, if you are experiencing UTI, symptoms always get the urinalysis from your doctor to make sure that there's actually bacteria in your urine before or if you decide to go on antibiotics or else it's just going to make things worse because antibiotics are fairly harsh medications and so if you're just taking antibiotics even if it's not a bacterial cause one it's going to create some other havoc in the body and two it's not going to actually treat your urinary tract infection so actually getting the proper diagnosis is really important And then we know that some women are just prone to it just based on their anatomy, just based on the closeness of certain organs in that part of your body. You can just be prone to bacteria transferring. And regardless of if you're peeing after sex, if you're showering and you have great hygiene, drinking plenty of water, it may or may not make a huge difference. But making sure that whatever whatever the cause of your UTI like the root of your UTI symptoms are. So if that's cheese stagnation or damp heat or blood stagnation, or if it is a true yin deficiency, then treating that root will help your symptoms. 
So there's like um, a whole bunch of supplements too. Like I know what's it called? d mananos is also really good for chronic UTIs, I believe. And they say cranberry. I don't, I'm not sure if that's great for prevention or when you actually are having symptoms and probiotics because your microbiome can be huge because that is the the good bacteria in your bladder and urethra so if it's you got bad bacteria invading it a lot and taking over if you've got enough good bacteria then it should help fight that so that's also a really important thing but i i find herbs to be so helpful for utis i do know that from personal experience the one and only uti i had in my life was in chinese medicine school i did take antibiotics because it was torturous and so it originally like the symptoms went away really fast like after a day or two so i finished the course of antibiotics i thought i was good but then like a week later i started getting the symptoms again it wasn't like full-blown but it just like it was just still kind of lingering there Oof, hate oh that. it was the worst yep. oh it's, it's the worst yeah. feeling and then um yeah it just wouldn't it wouldn't go away so i was like okay whatever screw this and so i went to like the student clinic and then i just got a whole bunch of herbs for uh my bladder symptoms and i believe from what I remember, I think there were a lot of just stampede clearing herbs. And I took that, uh, a few days of that, and like I've been amazing and perfect and fine ever since. So <gasps> herbs can be so, so helpful for UTI. Wow. Wow. I'd probably recommend that over acupuncture for specifically for UTI symptoms. Yeah, because I feel like this topic alone was very interesting only because... It's very Western based, I guess, because we're talking about bacteria, right? And I feel like in TCM, we don't really talk about bacteria. It's more like mm -hmm. granular stuff. So um, I like how you're marrying the two together mm -hmm. right now. Yeah, well, that's that's how I do my practice. I am very integrative. I want to take the best of both and what makes sense in the both and combine it to create the most effective kind of medicine because Western medicine totally has its great parts. Antibiotics can be wonderful and life-saving. And then, you know, holistic Chinese medicine stuff is really great at filling in the gaps. Mm -hmm. This is just very, like, mind-blowing because uh, I've never heard of someone using herbs to cure UTI is always, always, always antibiotics. And we all know antibiotics not good. So this is great to know that you could potentially use herbs. Now, you used it when the symptoms were more mild. Now for symptoms that are more severe, like you're in it, um, would it work as fast? Or I know herbal medicine like takes a while, like it takes like either a week or like I don't know even longer maybe how how fast do you think it would work because obviously you don't want to have UTI for like longer than two days yeah <laughs> right um yes it can it can because so a UTI is an acute thing so acute things like uh, a headache or the common cold or a, U yeah, a UTI if those are addressed with herbs right away and then you're like taking the herbs like the herbal formula maybe like up to three or four times a day and you're just hitting it really hard you can absolutely clear it fast it's more so of like the chronic things like if you've had kidney indeficiency for years that's when it's going to take weeks in order for you to notice a change in your symptoms because it's there's kind of like the longer that you've had the disease the longer it's going to take to treat it but then the shorter that you've had the disease the shorter and faster you can treat it because it's it's been more temporary in the body it hasn't caused that sort of chronic long-lasting damage so yes you can absolutely and what i would recommend for this like if you if you have flare-ups or something even if it's if it's anything if it's migraines or autoimmune symptoms or whatever it is and it's very it's the same and it presents in the same way in your body then I would just prescribe my patient herbs to have on hand at all times. And so they know if they're getting these little inklings, symptoms of something's coming on, something's about to flare up, they have that formula that they can go to right away. They don't have to see me. They don't have to uh, call and make an appointment and wait a week or whatever if my schedule is full. They can do, they just have it on hand to, to take right away. And as long as this is obviously under direct supervision <laughs> of a practitioner, um, 
then it can be really helpful for you know nipping things in the bud. It's crazy, crazy. I I never knew that you could potentially heal the jong organ or whatever it is in your body, so you won't have UTIs. Because I just thought like, yeah, okay, whatever. TCM can't heal UTIs. <laughs> oh, it totally can. It is. I've seen wow. some powerful things that herbs have done um, in the body. Okay, name one. <laughs> Uh, common cold. It can like knock fevers out real fast if it's the right formula and strong enough and you're taking it often enough. Um, yeah, migraines again. If you've got like some acute pain that flares up, it can be really helpful for that. Mm, okay. That's good to know. Thank you. Um, I kind of had another random question that kind of related back to the first one. Because <laughs> you talked about you know, uh, not wearing crop tops. <laughs> now, you <laughs> you mentioned you mentioned like uh, if a person has yang deficiency in their kidney, they run a little bit more cold in their hands and feet. Now, does that mean that you should wear like socks all the time? Like people don't wear socks sometimes, and they wear they go barefoot everywhere. So. Uh, what are the effects of going barefoot all the time? Because I know you also have a lot of different pressure points and, you know, there's your foot is kind of like the map of your body in a way as well. Just like how your head is the map of your body. So you should always keep your head and your feet warm. Is that right? Is that right? Did I just answer my own question? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, to an extent, kind of, yeah. So Keeping your feet warm is totally like a hallmark Chinese medicine thing, especially if you have like kidney or spleen yang deficiency. If you always have cold feet, you always need to have something on them. Even if they don't feel cold, if they're cold to touch, they're cold. And so socks and slippers and keeping your feet warm is just so important in Chinese medicine. Like I always tell, um, because yeah, there's the, the kidney, the spleen, and the liver channels, the three really important yin organ systems, they all have channels that go to the feet. The kidney especially, the channel starts in the bottom of the foot. So if you're stepping on a lot of really cold things, then that can go through the channel and it can go all the way up to your kidney. So keeping your feet warm is really important. And then especially, I always tell my patients after like they have an embryo transfer or if they can be pregnant, keep your feet warm because those channels go directly to the uterus. So keeping your feet warm means a warm uterus as well. And yeah, people don't wear socks now because so many people have yin deficiency and when you have yin deficiency your feet usually feel really warm like if you're someone whose feet feel really hot especially at night because it's the yin time of the day or of the night then and if you feel that more prominently at night you have a lot of yin deficiency with creating the sort of empty heat and that's manifesting in really hot feet and so a lot of people have yin deficiency so a lot of people are just walking around in flip-flops when it's you know fall and winter like it's no problem because they have this empty heat which is this false heat um that they're that it's manifesting as so people that are like need you know slippers and warm socks and everything even in summer probably have young deficiency and it's manifesting in cold feet but if those people that are wearing you know flip-flops and sandals in the fall and winter they probably have the deficiency <laughs> and that's how it's manifesting uh, such a wild concept that a majority of people don't know like majority of the people <laughs> don't know that i mean i'm chinese so like my grandparents and my parents would tell me stuff like that without knowing why and we would just have to do it at a young age because we're told to but damn thank god we did yeah we really <laughs> lost a lot of this sort of ancient knowledge like all of these really easy things like eating warm food going to bed at a decent time at night like yeah we, we understand that it's important but we don't really realize the extent to it and we've we've lost so much of this ancient knowledge of things that we can really easily do to take care of ourselves and i think that's one of the really beautiful things about chinese medicine is that we're going back to these really easy basic fundamental things that can have a huge impact on your health yeah for sure Okay, well, thank you so much for explaining the functions and the importance of keeping our kidney and your, your damn it, sometimes I can't say this word, <laughs> no urinary bladder healthy. Uh, we should 
we should especially take care of our kidneys because it houses our essence. It's so important. It's life, as as you said it. It's top two, top two. <laughs> so. You've been so amazing, and uh, like the conversation we have is super fascinating, and it's amazing to learn. Again, I will link all of your information in the show notes and on my Instagram. If you hadn't checked her out, please do because she's so funny, and she dig really <laughs> deep into the explanation of some of the issues with fertility and periods, which I really like because、mm-hmm. I actually learn a lot from your from your posts, like TikTok posts, <laughs> even though they're quick. But like, oh, okay, good.、I'm、I do、glad. learn from it. Yeah. <laughs> So please、uh, hop over to her page to check her out as well. Well, as always, please stay warm and healthy out there, and I'll catch you on the next entry. Bye. If you like this episode, please give it a like. If you would like to hear future episodes, please subscribe. Or if you have any questions about health, please send me an email at kuko dot health. At gmail dot com, which is k u k o dot health. If you just want to say hi or drop me a DM on Instagram, come follow me at kuko dot health, which is again k u k o dot health. Thank you so so much for listening to me today, and please stay warm and healthy out there. And I'll catch you on the next episode. Bye.